Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much for uh, facilitating and making this possible. And thank you for all of you to be here. Um, I, I do like to start by saying that um, you know, I think important times um, in terms of what's been going on in the dialogue, not only at the, at the United States level, but also internationally about uh, what's been happening at you know, uh, migration, refugees, and you know, this, 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 I guess, wave of um, displacements of individuals or of people that are happening from one country to another country, but also takes its root causes from a lot, a lot of other elements. But I think particularly what I would like to do is to kind of um, talk a little bit about what we do at Interfit Works and how it ties into the bigger picture of um, you know, what we do to refugee resettlement and then, and then what does it mean to us at the at small cities like Syracuse. Um, so a uh, couple things to keep in mind, Interfit Works, it's been an agency that's been serving Center for New Mar or uh, Upstate Area for about 41 years now. And so one of the things that this agency has um, is, um, is that it has four main programs. And each program is designed to tackle or perhaps address a component of our society by addressing the needs, uh, the grievances in the community, whatever they might be. So um, you have the Senior Companion Program, where it kind of works with our seniors in, in, the, in the community. You have Center for Dialogue, uh, a, a program and initiatives that we operate under, facilitating dialogue between youth and the community, addressing issues of racism, um, and also kind of facilitating high school exchange programs where schools from different, uh, students from different schools are getting an opportunity to speak with one another, um, but also uh, kind of on the issue of police dialogue where we allow an opportunity for young, young generation to speak with, a, with our law enforcement. Uh, so different initiative under that program. Uh, another program that we have is called Interfit Initiatives and that's uh, particularly focuses on spiritual care where we provide chaplaincy to um, people who needs in the hospitals, um, that, um, that may use that as a, as a way to meditate or perhaps for any, for any matter as far as help is concerned. Uh, and the last program, perhaps but not least, the largest is called Center for New Americans. And, and uh, what we do within, this, within that program, and this is a program that I work under, and um, is, is, is primarily focuses on refugee resettlement. So from the first day that they arrived in the United States, to how we kind of get them through the process of making sure they have their green social security cards, they have their insurance, health insurance, they have access to uh, public uh, programs, welfare programs, uh, getting them job, ESL classes. So you can think of the resettlement, resettlement process as this uh, variety of checklists that you go through as making sure that someone gets integrated in the community, but also or you're doing it as someone who professionally wants to help um, individuals go through that process. Uh, by getting, in, you know, getting attached to the community, adapting the culture and accepting the culture and going through this change. I'll talk a little bit more in detail. So in this presentation, uh, what I'll try to do is focus primarily on Center for New Americans, the one program that we do the refugee resettlement. Uh, one of the first things that I always ask, and we go, we go through a lot of the presentation when we ask because this is part of what we do, we try to educate the community about some of the things that uh, we want our community members perhaps, or the citizens of this community that we live in upstate is to be educated on some of the important matters of how these families, um, where they come from, what, what are the reasons behind it, and so important. Common, common misperception oftentimes is the definition of refugee. What is, who is a refugee and what, what entitles? This is directly taken from UNHCR. This is the definition of uh, that they come up with that individuals that are actually uh, forcefully, they're running away from violence, persecution, um, for, for, for a variety of reasons. And you can read it yourself, but one of the things that I would do like to do, because this is a new setting, and oftentimes we talk to community members who are interested more in uh, understanding the idea of you know, why they come in. But this is an academic setting, so what I try to do is uh, see if I can show a video, kind of shows a history of, um, shows a history of the refugees all the way back from World War II and goes back further down uh, in the emergence of the UNHCR and kind of paints a picture and will come back to present days. And then we'll take it back and move on to talking about the resettlement process, how we resettle in Syracuse, and talk about some of the challenges that we have as we're moving forward. 
So uh, I'll, I'll just play a short video. Um, it's about five minutes and then we'll move on to discussion. Syria, a country fractured, 
four million refugees have fled to nearby countries. Over seven million are internally displaced. And at sea, thousands of lives lost. Syrians, Somalis, Eritreans, Ethiopians, all in search of a safer life. The challenges grow alarmingly. UNHCR, over 60 years after its birth, will face them all. Innovating and adapting and counting on a protection mandate that is one of the strongest in international law. Partnerships with over 900 other agencies and strong support from donors, governments, and people like you. One thing that I do like to highlight from the video is that when they talked about the definition of refugees, it talked about people that are away from their homeland, meaning that they have crossed the boundaries of uh, internationally recognized state borders. And so for someone to even get the title of a refugee, you have to be away from your homeland. And so for a lot of the families that we serve or that they come into Syracuse is that very case. They're no longer in their home country. And so one of the important facts that I want to put out there is that there are three nations that produces, have produced 50 or more than 50% of the worldwide refugees. And that's Afghanistan, Syria, and Somalia. And another fact is that the United States is not the largest resettlement or perhaps a country that has accommodated refugees. You know which countries are? Turkey, Turkey. Pakistan. Iran, those are the countries that actually are accommodating and uh, not resettling perhaps, but are, but are families that are staying in those countries. So a couple key important things, and we'll come back to this because I think the title of getting a refugee is another key element to this process. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail uh, in, a, in a few slides. But those are a few things to keep in mind. Um, the process, and oftentimes we talk about this because it's, it's very critical for a lot of us to know what, what is the process that these individuals go through. And so here's how it starts. So remember imagining an individual crossing the boundaries and coming over to UN, to UNHCR, registering for someone who is fleeing violence or whatever the case might be. So every individual's case is different. And so they come in and register, and then United Nation, based on their status or based on their application process, they give them the refugee status. Then what happens is that from there, I'm not sure if some of you have been recently following the news, but about a couple months ago, or a few months ago, uh, President uh, the White House decided on, a, on a president, what's called a presidential determination, a number that United States agreed to take each year, a physical year. The physical year for the refugee resettlement program, like any other government program, starts from October 1st to September 30th of the next year. So for this year, United, uh, President Trump agreed to accommodate or welcome uh, 45,000 refugees. Uh, something we can get into, but again, uh, depending on how detailed the questions are. So then what happens is that each country uh, makes a commitment. Germany, Canada, France, and then United, United UNHCR processes those refugees that they have applications that they've been sitting in the, ref, in the camps, refugee camps for so long, then what happens is that they get referrals to those specific countries. And then what happens is that then this vetting and this screening process begins. That host nation country, so there's a vetting process, an application process that happens to make sure that before they're even given the issue or the status of refugee, they're vetted through the UNHCR process. And then they get it handed over to a host nation country who are um, um, another, another option. So remember when I was talking about the idea of you giving this refugee title? So essentially each refugee has three options. One is that they can return back to their home country. Maybe they've lived in a refugee camp for 12, 15 years, and they, that country has changed, governments have changed, now they're more open to whatever uh, views their public or their citizens have. They can go back. That's, a return policy is another one that they could go back. The second one is that that host nation that are holding them as refugees, someone that could accommodate them, welcome them in their communities, and give them legal status. The third is the 
option that we're talking about right now, where they can actually move from like Turkey and Pakistan and other countries to a country like Canada, United States, and Germany. And, and so what happens, the vetting process starts. For United States, currently, these are institutions that are doing the vetting process. And so you got the Homeland Security, um, you got the um, uh, Department of Defense, Department of States, US intelligence community, and you got the Department of Health. And there's one more thing. There's even document, document fr forensic documentation in the process too, where they cross-check documentations to make sure that you have not said something and now you've changed your narrative or your story based on that. So there's even to that level of vetting that involves. And this process can take years and years. And it's not a matter of, oh, you know, I've checkmarked this, I can move on to the next. And they can investigate and look into a case for as long as they wish. And I will talk a little bit about my story as well because I actually went through this process of coming to the United States myself. And I was in that process for about five years to even get through the vetting process. Um, and so what happens is those, the vetting is cleared out and then what happens is you're determined for, you're, you're given an approval for resettlement. And this is where local entities like us, or at the national level, we get involved. So once the clearance is all done, then we get involved as far as saying, yes, we will accommodate this, this family, or you know, we cannot based on the needs, based on whatever the case might be. So what happens is that we, we, look, at the, we look at the case as an agency, we look at the needs, we look at their bio data. If there are intensive medical needs that we can provide or we cannot provide, then we say yes or no based on our capacities. If there's someone else better suited in, in another part of the nation, uh, another state that could do this case better or accommodate this case better, then they say yes to this case rather than us. So it, it's a, there's a process involved into this, but endorsements are taking place as we speak when we, when, we, uh, when we do the cross check from handover from one department to another department. And then what happens, the preparation for travel takes place and they arrive to the United States. And so they come into, uh, Hancock International in this case, the Syracuse uh, Airport, and, and, and we, one of the case managers and a family, a US tie, we go welcome them into Syracuse and making sure that they have all the needs that they have, uh, that they need in, 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 in order to um, you know, be welcomed, accept Syracuse as home. We'll talk more about that process. So here's how it looks for us. You got the United Nation, Department of Homeland Security, and other departments, Bureau of, and this is at the national level, uh, Bureau of Population, Refugee, and Migration, uh, and then you have the nine resettlement agencies at the top. We're a grassroots, what's called a grassroots resettlement agency that we do all the work. But in reality, you have nine resettlement agencies that are working with the uh, PRM, and then what, what, and in return, they work with the State Department, and then they work with the United Nations. So that flow of information and how families flow through this pipeline is then handed over to us and there are currently two entities in Syracuse area that are doing refugee resettlement. One is called, you might have heard, CYO or Catholic Charities. And so you remember when I mentioned the nine resettlement agency, I'll show you in a minute what those are, but two of them are right here. Catholic Bishops is one of them that works primarily, and this is a funding, funding source that they come in and they get the funding from that source as far as resettlement, and doing, if families that go through this resettlement agency goes through CYO or gets resettled through CYO, another local in, uh, organization that are doing refugee resettlement. And then we work with Episcopal Migration Ministries, another one of those nine resettlement agencies at the national level. So we resettle them, we work directly with them. Again, uh, a little bit of different, but a lot of it is funding and we have our, our um, um, these are the nine resettlement agencies. And as you, make, as, you make, as you can probably tell, six of these are faith-based uh, organizations or resettlement agencies. And so what happens when I was explaining a little earlier, this is, this is those resettlement agencies and then they push these families through the pipeline to make sure that we, as a local resettlement agencies, we get them to resettle or welcome them to Syracuse in this case. Again, we talked about executive orders and obviously we know that there's not one, there was not two. Uh, in fact, there was four of them or 3.5 up to got to that level. And so there's the, there's the first one that came out January 27th. I think the dates really matter and I think those are important. At the bottom you can see the countries that have been on that list for um, the travel ban that was, that was put, in, put in place. Uh, what I do want to highlight is the ones that you see in red are the countries that are 
uh, predominantly uh, been in all of the executive orders, throughout all four of them. So this is the second one that came out. And I mean, obviously, for those who have been involved in the news and the media, you can see how they, you know, they, um, the conversation moved from um, the Justice Department or the court to the White House and how they have come up with new ones or they've made revisions on the travel ban. This is the third one. And then the final one that came out. A lot of times it's not considered the fourth executive orders, but people refer to it as the 3.5. But again, the idea behind it was, um, was to kind of prevent some of the host, some of the countries or the people from these countries to come to the United States. And obviously the basis of that was security reasons, national security, as I mentioned. But obviously, and I, I'll be open to question, and we can talk a little bit about this to see what that will in, in, encounter, what we have encountered uh, as far as a, res a local resettlement agency to that aspect. Uh, we are, New York State is the fifth largest resettlement state in the, in the nation. And you can see, and you know, I guess the idea of normal is no longer to be a, a subject to a question or a discussion anymore because we used to, between both of the agencies, we used to resettle about 1,200 people every year in Syracuse. Meaning between CYO, the Catholic Charities, and us, we used to resettle 200 people. And this does not include, so remember, we're talking only about refugees. So this does not include individuals that come in on student visa and other matters, or immigrants. Uh, some of you may have read the um, Syracuse.com, the news media that came out. Uh, a few graphs from there, and you can see, and I think this is an important one, where you can see where we are in 2017. But what I can tell you is, is from uh, working in one of these local resettlement agencies, and obviously the Syracuse.com mentioned about 70 to 75, 72% of reduction in terms of our resettlement or number of arrivals and families that come in. But you know, from an agency perspective, I can say that that number is even higher. We're up to like 85, 85% in terms of how numbers have been drastically drawn down on us uh, to, um, you know, as far as our, what we used to welcome to where we are. But the reason I constantly have that 1,200 people in there, because that was the sort of, I guess, the baseline. That's where we always stayed at. That was the number, the capacity that we always had. Center for New Americans, obviously, to do the resettlement. And you can think of all the things that, as students, we all think about, right? So what about health? What about food? What about housing? What about all of these things that you know, kind of makes you feel at home or get accommodated or integrated into society? There's a lot of things that play, key play, uh, play a key role in here. And so what we have done in, in the um, Center for New Americans in that program at Interfaith Works is we try to have the specific categories of services that we provide for our families. And so here they are, some of it. Uh, uh, R&P, reception and placement services, what we refer to as, uh, is something that um, um, is key. And these are, by law, what we refer to as cooperative agreement, an agreement that we make with our national agencies that we provide. And those are, needs to be done absolutely on time Every, every single time we welcome a family. What are some of those services? They are getting in social security cards on time, making sure their kids go to schools on time. Um, they have welfare, they have health insurance, they, have, um, they, you know, they get a job, they get cultural orientation, they get vaccination. You, know, you can think of all those things, but the RMP services specifically talk about each individual family that go through absolutely every single one of those activities. And each caseworker, what we refer to as case managers in our, in our office, is assigned to a family. And they work with each individual family to address those needs. And then you have another program of ours that's called Matching Grant Program. This was a program that was designed to, you know, one of the things that I always say is that you have an international talent that come into Syracuse. You have people that are qualified to work. They're not nobody. They have worked in their life, they're carpenters, they're welders, they're doctors, they're nurses, they're engineers. So what happens is that you have this international talent who could come in and they're lawful and they can immediately jo join the workforce and begin becoming taxpayers. So what you can do is, uh, the matching grant program is that look, you have these qualified candidates that come in, they immediately wanna start a job. That match grant program, what it does is that it kind of prevents them to go from going to welfare. And for those who you know what welfare is, it's a pretty complicated process where families have to qualify. Uh, it's an income-based qualification and where you have to go and get SNAP uh, cash assistance and food stamps and 
housing, housing assistance, but also health insurances and Medicaid and stuff like that. But again, that program, what it does is kind of prevents families from going that route. If you are skilled enough, if you're employable, you want a job immediately, you want to become you know, employed, we have employment programs. We immediately enroll everyone to go through that process and get him a job. And we can talk a little bit more about depending on the questions. Uh, with mental health, employment, immigration, ESL, what's oftentimes referred to as ENL, English as a new language, not as a second language, because a lot of these guys that come in are bilingual already. They speak two or more languages. We have another program. Uh, some of you may have heard of, of the wet foot, dry foot program that President Obama ended right before he walked out of the office. That's the Cuban Asian program that we welcome the Cuban Asians families. And then we have an intensive case management program that some of our families, depending on their health status and depending on what the needs are, because you know, it's a, resettlement is a complicated process. And for a lot of these families to go through these changes, you know, they, they develop a lot of mental, um, I guess difficulties as they as they go along this process, and so we know that it's important. And you know, I can speak for myself because I know one of the most difficult things I've been through in my life was the resettlement and the adjustment to my life in America. And we can talk a little bit more about that again. So again, the community integration programs that we have available for of engaging our families into community, into the civic life of America, uh, American societies. So what happens, the pre-arrival? So remember what I was talking about, us as a local refugee resettlement saying, yes, we were gonna take these families? So this is what happens. We get, we get a pre-arrival notification saying that this family wants to come to Syracuse. Somebody within our office, we look at their bio data, and we say, yes, we're ready, we will take them, and then we prepare. We prepare for the um, you know, adjustment, making sure that we have a house for them, the house rents and security deposit is paid off, immediately before they even come to the United States. So that's something we have to do. The house have basic furniture, beds, bed sheets, pillows, you can name it, and all those simple things. Spoons, forks, can opener, you can name it. Simple things like that. Uh, so those are all critical because that's what you need in order to live, in order to survive. And so um, that's what happens, is, and, and then we move on in the process of making sure that we have an arrival. Again, these are the conditions that we look into a house for our families in Syracuse. And for those who have lived in like the north side Syracuse, you know housing conditions are terrible and, uh, and are not in a good standards, perhaps I should say, for, for lack of a better term. But what I can say is that affordability, safe and decent, um, furnished and accessible. Some of our families have disabilities. They can't climb upstairs. They, they have not been lived in, a, in an apartment style housing. So they have to get used to that kind of a, I guess, an adjustment. But again, so these are the things that we look into when we're trying to identify a house that is, kind of meets all the criteria. And it's pretty difficult to do. And it's a, we have a whole department that specifically works on, on this matter. Um, uh, obviously, funding is a big issue on this process. And so for every single member of a family or every single arrival, what we refer to uh, is, is there, they will be getting $925. And so what happens is that uh, one of the things that I didn't mention was during the process of resettlement, the actual resettlement time for a family is 90 days, three months. You divide $925 by, by 90. That's $10.25 per day. So, but what happens is that we use that money, the $925, then you multiply it by the number of family members. So if you have a family of three, that's like $3,700, if I'm doing the math correctly. And so you, what happens is after, out of that $3,700 for a family of three that comes in, a couple with a child, you already have paid the house, the security deposit in the first month's rent. Does that make sense? So that's where you start with that money. And obviously when the families come in, we know there's needs. Some of them have, um, you know, their specific needs for family. They, some of them smoke. Um, the child may need a lollipop or whatever. So you have to give them a little cash. So when they come in, we give them a little bit of cash to make sure that's an emergency fund that they could use because we know we cannot be there for them every single day for 24 seven, unless necessary, right? So but they, could, they could come up independent where they can go to shopping themselves, where they can go visit the local markets. Again, that's also part of integration that what we do, but that's where we stand, $925 per individual, per family that comes and gets. We get the arrival on the first day in the United States. 
This is very important, and in fact, we do have a family of seven that's arriving today, and my colleagues and I were just talking about your first meal, hot meal. We have to provide, in accordance with cooperative agreement that we have signed, a hot meal that's culturally appropriate, meaning from their culture. It's a family from Afghanistan, we have to provide Afghani food. You can name it, from Nepal, India, or, or one of the African countries. And then what happens is that within 24 hours, we have to, this is no question, we have to visit them in 24 hours. So we drop them off tonight, within the 24 hour timeline, we have to visit them again to go over a few basic things. We have to give them enough time to rest and then visit, go over a few important issues. Emergency, how to call 911. You know, go over how to use a stove, <coughs> a refrigerator, what you can put in the freezer, what you cannot. Um, uh, how to access interpretation. How do you behave in community? So that kind of an orientation is necessary and our case managers are doing to kind of get families involved and also get them educated. You know, this is home for them. This is the final destination. They're no longer in that process of, you know, I'm gonna go next day. This is no longer temporary. This is a permanent solution. And so we have to do things as, as to what we can do to make sure that the family is welcomed and they're accepting this place, meaning Syracuse, as home. Uh, you know, I talked about pocket, pocket cash, initial groceries. This is something we do. Every single family member that come in, they have to have a cell phone. Again, part of the necessary, calling 911. Those are critical parts of this, is that we have to get this. And all that money comes out of the $925. For a single person, so you can think of how fast that money will, be, will just vanish. A, a house rent is only $400 for a single bed. I mean, if you can find it. So you, $800 of secure deposit and rent together, it's already gone. All you have is $125 to work with. And out of that, you have to get a family with a phone. You have to get them, um, you have to get them as, um, you know, initial as cash, some groceries, some stuff before the food stamp kicks in, before all these other matters. So this is where a lot of the work that we've been doing is as a, as a resettlement agency, what we refer to as the work we do is called a public-private partnership program. Meaning that if we can do to minimize the cost of some of the expenditures that we have by involving the community to welcome, that's gonna be the most important thing. So we've been accepting donations, furnitures, and stuff from the community where they wanna get rid of things and they simply wanna donate to help a family. They wanna sponsor a meal or something for a, for a family. We've been having a lot of sponsorship lately because of the holiday season. Christmas, people were sending gifts for our families. So, uh, you know, the public-private partnership program goes hands to hands, and this is the reason why we try to engage as much as we can into the public, because they need to know and they need to be part of this. Because if we learn one thing in this process, is it does not take one person to do the resettlement. It takes the entire community. It takes the guys that are actually checking out on the Dollar General store, to the guys that are actually setting in the welfare programs. It takes everyone to have that sense of empathy and understanding the context of where these families are coming from, but yet at the same time, be well, I mean, not only from the know, you know, uh, this idea of knowing where they're coming from, but also being accommodative to you know, operating differently. Because if, you, if someone approaches to you and doesn't speak English, you, you have to be willing to sort of, I guess, go a different route versus serving someone who is a citizen here. I mean, it's a different process, and I can say this because I've been through this process myself, and I know how the difficulty was, and what the difficulties I had when I came in and integrated to society. First 90 days, this is what happens in the first 90 days. We have to have these things done. If we do not have any of these then, and by the first 90 days for our families, we have to have a better reason why. So think of the monitoring and audit that takes place. So if we cannot register a child into school within 30 days, for whatever reason, then we have to have an answer to why those things are, are, have been happening the way they are. I mean, I can tell you from experience that working with Syracuse um, uh, School District, it's not an easy task. We have come a long way to even putting in procedures in place where we are right now for welfare programs to give a family food stamp, emergency food stamp right away without getting their social security numbers is, is, a, is a commitment to make and that's, there's a lot of bureaucracy involved in our process. And so what happens is that uh, you, know, you apply for social security, they don't hand you the social security number or the card right away. You have to wait two weeks. You cannot wait two weeks because you have to do all these other things. 
Medicaid cannot operate without Social Security. Uh, vaccinations won't take place. A school enrollment will have to be delayed. So if any of these does not happen within those 90 days, we have to have a justification. I know I've been talking. I promise we'll get into the question. One of the things that I'm fascinated with is, and I can open it up to questions and maybe on the slide, is that um, I call this resettlement dynamics. What I mean by this is that just like any of us, every single family, there are several layers or simultaneously, there's a lot of things that are happening in our life that we don't see. What happened to the appointment? Did I pick up my kids? What happened to the shopping? All of these things we think of simultaneously. So here's how a family and a refugee thinks when they're thinking about um, uh, you know, resettlement or what the mindset they have in mind. And I can confirm this by because I went through this process myself. Um, what about transportation? And somehow, they're all connected. And so uh, we can spend more time on this, but uh, I've just got the signal that we got three more minutes, so let's go through it. But important element, right? Because you are dealing with a lot of things that are connected with one another. So when you meet a family and they're talking about shopping while the subject matter is mental health, you know they're connected somehow, for them at least, right? Or for any other matter, right? This was my last slide. And I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for being here and, and, and willing to listen. But I'm, I'm going to open it up to question. I, um, I, I do want to say that, um, again, it's, it, takes, it takes a village or it takes a community for to do this work. And we cannot do this without the help of institutions such as Syracuse University. And just for the record, I do want to say that uh, Syracuse University have been involved in different um, capacities helping our families. One of the tangible things that we did with Syracuse University, they've dealing with computers, use computers to help our families not only get, you know, uh, computer literacy programs, but also how to how to you know apply for jobs, ESL, um, connect with family, loved ones overseas through a Skype and other matters, right? So we've been great grateful for this. Uh, but yeah, so thank you for very much. Let's, let's, I, if can I take a few questions? Yes. Yes, sir. Can you name three problems of resettlement in Syracuse? Um, good question. I, I um, you know, when I when I mentioned when I mentioned the dynamics, right? When I when I talked about this slide, one of the things that I would say, and the bubbles represent the bigger they are, the more challenging that becomes. <laughs> so uh, some of the top ones that we have faced uh, constantly is language. Uh, this idea that they don't know or they don't have as much knowledge as we do. So you constantly have to educate. Um, jump in, if I, if I may. Uh, housing is a big issue for a lot of our families. Uh, so we just paid a house for rent of security deposit for the first month. Family come in after a week, they realize they didn't like this house. They have to go to another one. And then you can talk about you know, how that difficult it is to transition to a new home and the security deposit and all those other elements that involves. Um, Employment is a big, big thing. For a lot of the families that come in and they're engineers or they have a professional career that have built for themselves and they come in and the best we could offer them, a cleaning job at Destiny Mall, it's a, it's a big pill to swallow. And so you, be, you need to be willing to accept that you're starting from zero, but yet you know, with, the, with this idea that you're living in an, in an environment that security is no longer a challenge, that you can go back to that ladder continue to move on and progress and, and, um, and uh, you know, just, just keep that hope in there. And I guess part of the American idea, right? So kind of, there's no stop, there's no barriers, the sky's the limit. I hope I answered it, but there's, you know, there's a lot of these things in many aspects, because you live in this dynamic, everything is connected. Everything is connected to one another. Any other question? You guys want to add up anything before I? Yes, ma'am. You commented that there's, a, you know, that the university has had a role to play in Center New Americans um, and, and interfaith works in general. I know there's been relationships. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, myriad of relationships, but specifically, I'm thinking about, um, you know, there's there's students who are only here for a short period of time who sometimes feel personally connected to um, refugee to the topic or intellectually or personally interested. And sometimes it's difficult to navigate that space of, of how to get connected. There are certain agencies in our community that have 
services for refugees where there's a space where you can come and do a thing. But yes, ma'am. I'm curious about Center for New Americans because you don't really, and maybe you do, maybe you could tell me a little bit more yes, about ma'am. Um, is there a space where refugees convene regularly? It sounds like you're, you're putting, you're the pass through to put them into the into here and help them get set up. But yes, when ma'am. you talk about, for example, the computer classes, right, that must be hard when you have families all over the city <laughs> I, to bring know. them back together. So how does that work? And um, how could someone start thinking <clears throat> about connecting? So uh, when you're thinking about refugee resettlement, obviously this isn't, the task is not only accomplished by one entity. You know, they have other entities that are doing similar work, what they refer to as post-resettlement services. Uh, I'm thinking of RISE. I'm thinking of, I've, some of you may, know, may have heard of Bob School uh, offering ESL classes. So while we do not have permanent solution to a long-term processes, while we do have at some various levels we do, but you know, at, at that permanent level that you're talking about, we don't. But we, what we do is we work with entities and other organizations, nonprofits, that are offering those services. So there's, if we don't have a computer literacy class uh, or financial literacy class, we work with an institution or with a volunteer or with an intern that kind of has that expertise where they can meet one-on-one with our families and do some of those work. So um, think of this as an approach that, you know, it takes the community health centers, uh, the other nonprofit organizations that are also in the community area or in the Syracuse community area that are also willing to accommodate but also serve these families for a longer period of time. The difficulty then again becomes, you know, what happens if you get a family to the job while the schedules do not or in conflict with the time? So then you have to stay innovative, right? You, stay, you have to continue to work on the individual base on how you can adjust their life and what other resources you can pull to help is still fill in that gap that exists, right? So um, we, what we have been working on recently, and I can say this, is that we are trying to offer more one-on-one family uh, trainings where they go in trying to get uh, um, you know, banking, learn about banking system, about the credit system, financial literacy. We do ESL classes. We do vocational trainings. Simply, one of the another initiatives that we had at Interfate is we asked the community to donate bikes, bicycles with helmets and stuff. So they did it. And so those bicycles will fall apart, and they don't know how to fix it. And then we had to get together a volunteer to come over, teach them how to change certain things and fix certain things, the brakes and stuff. So it takes those little bitty, small little greedy things that, that uh, will make a larger impact, not maybe to a larger group of us, but perhaps to that one family that are, that issue seems to be very big for them or a huge barrier in front of them. Um, but we do have, just to answer your question in, in simple terms, I think it's, uh, we do have institutions that we work with, that we partner with, and this includes Catholic charities uh, that we serve, and there's a lot of things that kind of cross, uh, go across one another in terms of our services. Well, I'm once again grateful. Thank you, uh, Margaret. Thank you so much for organizing this. And uh, let's keep the dialogue going. I, I really hope to see some of you being involved in some of the work we do. And uh, I also want to say that we do take interns. We do take volunteers. If you like to come over and talk, you never know. You open that discourse. You open that window of opportunity. And you like to help someone. You just ask. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say. Thank you once again. <laughs>